This is a war story from 24 years ago. In 1991, before GPS, the Global Positioning System, I was a field artillery battery commander in the first Gulf War with a battery of eight howitzers. Our mission at that time was to find, fix, and destroy the Iraqi Republican Guards divisions and force their withdrawal from Kuwait. Pictured here is our area of operations, which is about the same size as the area from South Carolina to Ohio. Now, as a battery commander, my command included eight howitzers, eight ammunition carriers, assorted track vehicles, trucks, and about 130 soldiers. At that time, GPS was not used for fire missions. Uh, we only had about a thousand of these receivers in all of the Department of Defense. We in the battalion only had one, and it was in our battalion S3's uh, Humvee, and one Loran receiver. And its purpose was to help us navigate through this, a trackless desert, no terrain. So how did our, an artillery battery accurately fire uh, before GPS? There are two types of fire missions. One is a direct fire mission, like a hunter. You see it in your reticle pattern, you shoot it, and you kill it. The second is indirect fire, where you can't see the target. And we're going to talk about indirect fire today. So in a successful, in a field artillery fight, you have to know two things. One, where you're located, and two, where the enemy is located. Here's what we fire. A 155 millimeter howitzer round, 95 pounds of comp B, uh, American made, that would be put into the breach and propelled downrange with propellant looks like this. So how do you fire one of these 10 miles in front of you fast enough to make a difference without killing your friendlies and when killing the enemy? The process of indirect fire before GPS took a lot of uh, adjustment. Here we have a target to our front. The forward observer gets eyes on the target and he gives a call for fire with an estimated target coordinates back to the fire direction center. Once the FTC or Fire Direction Center acknowledges that call for fire, our clock starts. At that time, I would speed up in my Humvee. I would jump out in an area that was suitable for us to fire in from. I would pull out a compass, shoot a, an approximate azimuth in the direction I think the target was. I'd get out a nose plug like this and I'd throw it with engineer tape on it to put a white line on the ground for the house to pull up right in front of me with about 20 tons of steel. And then I would get out of the way. Simultaneously with that, my gunnery sergeant would then pull to the front of the line of that, that uh, metal. He would get out a thing called an Amy circle, and he would lay for direction the other seven howitzers that were then moving into position. Now, an Amy circle is like a surveyor's tool, except it measures in 6,400 mil increments as opposed to 360 degrees. And that gives you a whole lot more accuracy in your firing. Now, my fire matter with eight howitzers is traveling in a chevron formation. And at the tip of the chevron is what we call the base piece. It stops and it occupies its position. The base piece will then fire a non-lethal, in, in the case we used, illumination round, which is like a big flare in the sky, and we'd have it set for point detonating and so it would explode on the ground. When it hits, the forward observer would hopefully find it and adjust from that. The second round that he would call in a call for fire would be an HE round like this. In this example, Let's say that the first round is 3,000 meters beyond the target and then 4,000 meters to the left. The forward observer would give a bold adjustment and he might say right 4,000, drop 3,000. The second round, as I said, is a high explosive round and it would land 100 right and 50 over. So during this process, or 500 over, so during this process, the other seven howitzers would be following along in the mission. Finally, the observer would adjust with left 1,000, drop 500. If that round lands within 50 meters, all eight guns would fire for effect onto the target, with the whole process taking about 10 minutes. Now, these principles weren't unique just in the United States artillery. We've been using these for centuries. The Iraqis used them as well. On February 27, 1991, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I had an Iraqi artillery was being adjusted onto my battery. I was on the left flank of the battalion. Uh, off to our left front was a painted 55-gallon drum, fairly innocuous. But artillery rounds were landing 200 meters from that drum and 300 meters from my battery. Uh, I always insisted that my soldiers would dig survivability positions to get in below the shrapnel. They weren't going to fight from these, but it would help them survive. As soldiers are wont to do, mine were goofing off, not digging their positions. Uh, so after one round hit, I called a private over and I said, Hey, did you see what that was? 
No, sir. Another one hit. I said, did you see what that was? Do you know what it is? No, sir. I said, that is Iraqi artillery. Well, uh, when he ran back to a section, dirt was flying like what you would see in a Looney Tunes cartoon because uh, they were really uh, cautious of the fact that enemy artillery was being adjusted in on them and weren't paying attention. The Iraqis knew where they were. They knew where the barrel was, and they were trying to adjust their artillery onto us. Sometimes we forget what life was like before GPS, before each of us had it in our phones. In the first Gulf War, we would have the first round out in two minutes and a fire for effect uh, mission in ten minutes. Now, the process takes as long as it takes for the howitzer to stop and occupy and the ammunition to be prepared, maybe one minute. So that reduces the factor by time zone of eight. Additionally, the accuracy of GPS minimizes collateral damage and friendly fire losses. The Ford Observer today is equipped with GPS and a laser target designator, but today the Ford Observer may be uh, a remotely piloted aircraft or drone. It may be a camera. You still have to have eyes on the tar target. Excuse me. And today we know where each component is located. We know where each soldier is located. We know where each weapon system is located. And each artillery round, we know where it's located with GPS. GPS ensures that we hit the right target uh, the first time every time. So during the 100-hour war in 1991, the United States Army moved the equivalent of the city of Atlanta 8,000 miles to the Middle East. We fought and destroyed the majority of the Iraqi Republican Guard, and then my battery, which came out of Germany, safely redeployed back to Germany with all my soldiers. But most importantly, uh, in this whole iteration, I got to see my wife, Melanie, and my firstborn child, Rachel, who was already five and a half months old when, uh, when I returned home. A much younger version of me and of my daughter. And regardless of what technology we here at DARPA develop, or anyone else develops, it comes down to the final assessment that well-trained soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines have to step up to the task. They have to replace us old-timers, and we have to give it off to the next generation of soldiers uh, that are coming in board. Uh, just as my daughter Rachel has done as an Army nurse in Hawaii. Thank you for your attention. I would uh, welcome any questions you have. Questions? Open up for questions. Uh, the, GP, the adversary can also use GPS, so how has that changed the way we have to defend against the adversary? Okay, the adversary, uh, the question was the adversary also has GPS, how does that change how we fight? Um, they may know where we are, uh, and we actually have to be more cautious of the fact that they have GPS technology, and it's, it's something that we have to be cautious of and use it as a planning factor. But uh, in the end, and Lee Riverson will, talk, will speak after me, um, you cannot beat the training and the equipping that, that our, our American fighting forces have. They, they can know where we're at, but they're not going to be able to influence the like we it's just something, it's like the weather. We have to be cognizant of it and plan for it, but it's not something that's going to impact on how we fight. Oh, you did? Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, do you still need a Ford Observer if you're using GPS? Yes. Uh, as, as, even with GPS guided munition, you still have to have somebody looking at the target and giving you a grid to that target. Whether it's a laser off of a, off of a drone, or whether it's somebody on the ground looking at the target. Once again, it's indirect fire because the firing unit cannot see uh, what it's shooting at. So, uh, in, in many instances, some type of sensor has to be out there, even if you're going after mobile missiles or anything like that. Some type of targeting has to be looking at the target in fire. Okay, thank you, Glenn.